We're in a series that I've titled, Heal Our Land, Heal Our Land, and I believe we can all agree that our land needs healing. Like I said last week, when you look at the divorce rate in our country, it's evident that our land needs healing. When you look at the abortion rate in our country, 2.2 abortions per 100 pregnancies, it's evident that our land needs healing. When you look at the pandemic that's going around in our nation, it's evident that our land needs healing. When you look at the fact that there's still people that hate one another just because of their skin color, it's evident that our land needs healing. When you look at how people a lot of times treat each other online, and sometimes even the people of God, unfortunately, get mixed up in it of name-calling, belittling other people, and just trying to do whatever they can to hurt somebody else, it's evident that our land needs healing. How many would agree our land needs healing? Our land needs healing. We've read about it. We see it online. Uh, We read about it this week. You can see it in the news and even in the major organizations and people are writing about it. And and I was reading this week about uh, what can we do to heal our land. I read several articles from uh, big news sources and even politicians. What can we do to heal our land? And even a lot of the articles as I read them, as I got through the article, there were some good things in the article. But so many of them I read, it talked about the problems, the problems. And it said, but we need to heal our land and this is the problem and this is the problem and we need healing and this is the problem and this is the problem and we need healing and it got to the end and it never even offered any solution at all. Many of them, I read them very carefully, they didn't offer any solutions, it just was great at saying the problem but not really the solutions and then some of the articles that I read maybe gave uh, good solutions but they were really cliches and we just need to get along, we need to get along, we need to cool off and and things like that And, and I read some articles, a few that had some ideas, and I think some of them might have been even pretty good ideas maybe, but I think they really fell short. They really fall short of the prescription that God gives us because in 2 Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, God talks about healing our land, and he promises to do so, but he gives us the prescription of what we're supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I like to, how many of you like to have some directions if you don't know how to do some things, some instructions? sometimes. If I'm trying to figure something out, just get some instructions. Normally, I don't read them. When I get something, normally I try to put it together first, and then I look at the instructions afterwards. But we've got a prescription here. We've got a a prescription. Isn't it nice to have something when you have something going wrong, and and you can just, maybe something's going wrong with your car or something like that, and somebody can just put a finger on it and say, this is exactly what it is. I know the answer. And we have here in St. Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, God says, I got the answer. I got the answer. If you if you have a plague come, if you have these things happen, I have the answer. And so let's see what God says. Let's see what the voice of the Lord says for us, the prescription for the healing of our nation. He says, the Lord says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Thank God for his word, for his, his promise. He says seven things in that verse And I think by the end of this series, hopefully we'll know it. If you can't quote it already word for word, you'll be able to get pretty close. But he says seven things. He says, he says, if you will, he says, if you will humble yourself, you will pray, you'll seek my face. Four of the things he puts on us. He said, if you'll do this, if you'll humble yourself, pray. Seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. And then the other three, he's three, he says, This is what I'll do. I'll I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive your sin, and I'll heal your land. And I think we can all agree, our leaders agree, our media agrees, our, the experts, our nation, we all agree that our land is, is broken and that we need healing, we need God. But the question is, how bad do we want it? How bad do we want it? And he says, he says if my people, if my, we're, we are the people of God, we're the people of God, and it starts with us to examine our own heart. I want to see revival in our nation. How many of you want to see revival in this nation? Well, guess who it starts with? It starts with you. 
It starts with me. I got a shirt that Compassion International gave me this shirt, and I like to wear it. It's pretty old, uh, but I've been wearing it for a long time now, and I'm going to keep on wearing it. Even though it got holes in it, I'm going to wear it to the gym. But I put it on. Sometimes people look at me when I'm wearing this shirt, but the front, it says, it begins with me. And on the back, it says, it begins with you. And the thing is, with revival, it begins with you. Would you say this? It begins with me. If you're going to see revival in this nation, it begins with you. It begins with me because that's the only person you can control is you. And the only person I can control is me. But the question is, how bad do we want it? Because God promised. He promised to heal our land. And the question is, how bad do we want it? Because he's calling on us to respond. He said, I promise I'm going to do these three things, but I'm calling on you to respond. And I want to ask you this, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? So a couple of weeks ago, we went out to Colorado. I found some plane tickets for $126 a person round trip. So we went to Colorado and we played in the snow. We walked up in the mountains in snow that was up to your thighs. But we were driving around and we got to Colorado Springs and and we found us an In-N-Out Burger. How many have been to In-N-Out Burger before? Now, the In-N-Out Burger is a famous restaurant, and they have them in California. They have them in different places. And, and all they have is hamburgers, but I'm going to tell you, it's really good. And there's line, long lines a lot of times for the In-N-Out Burger. And, and uh, we got up to the In-N-Out Burger. And we, I was trying to find it. We got driven up there. And, and I looked, in the, and I rolled down my window. The guy says, are you here for dine-in? And I looked, and the line uh, was... The, the line was coming out, wrapped around, and it was going down the street. I wasn't even, in the, I was, I wasn't even at the end of the line. I, I was basically cutting. But it was down the street, wrapped around, and coming out a side road and then onto another street. There was probably 50, I don't know, 50 or 60 cars or more waiting in line for the In-N-Out Burger. And the guy says, you want to do dine-in? I said, well, yeah, we needed to use the restroom anyway. So we, we parked, and you, you couldn't go in, and you couldn't eat in, but you could wait in a queue line. They had a queue line outside, and... Um, and so we got, it was about 38 degrees outside probably, and we had to wait outside the restaurant in line. And the, it looked like the line was about 30, 35 minutes. You had to wait outside, then you'd go in and place your order, get your food, and you had to go back out and eat in your car. And, we, and, I, and I asked the girls, Emma had never been there before, Hal had been, but Emma had never been to In-N-Out Burger. And I said, you guys, this is going to be probably 30, 35 minutes, it's 38 degrees outside, do you want to wait outside in this line? They were like, yeah, Dad, we want to wait, we want to go to In-N-Out Burger. So we were waiting, and we were in the sun at the beginning, and I thought this is okay, because we're in sunlight, but when we got into the shade, 38 degrees was getting pretty cool uh, in the shade. And we were waiting through the line and it was, it was moving, but I said, look, it is going to take 30 or 35 minutes to get through this line. Y'all want to wait? Yeah, we want to wait. We want to get the in and out burger. And I was, I, we were waiting and as I was starting to get cold and as I was starting to get impatient, I realized that across the street, I saw that there was a Burger King across the street. And I thought, you know, there was no line for the Burger King at all. I mean, there's, <laughs> looks like 50, 60 cars for the In-N-Out Burger, and there's no line at all. And I started thinking, you know, Burger King has hamburgers too. They got French fries. They got milkshakes. We could go right over there, and we could go to the Burger King. And I said, we could go to the Burger King. And you sure you guys still want to wait? We were about 15 minutes into it. We probably had 15 minutes left. And you still want to wait? I was kind of getting cold. And um, uh, you st- yeah, we want to wait. And, and we waited, and we waited, and we got in there. And by the time we got there, I, gotta, I probably shouldn't be talking about this during the fasting. Maybe I should have come up with another another analogy, but I just decided I'm going to get me a triple burger. If I'm going to wait this long, I'm going to make sure that I get full by the time I get out of here. And we got it and we waited through and we got the t-shirt and and we did the whole thing. But the thing about In-N-Out Burger, if you want the In-N-Out Burger, you got to want it bad. I mean, you really do. I mean, you, you have to actually want that. And I was thinking as I was sitting there, but there's nobody, there was nobody at Burger King. There was nobody. At, I mean, there was no line at Burger King. People, can you imagine people drive by the Burger King and see that there's no cars? And pass it up. And they look at the In-N-Out Burger and there's 60 cars. And they know, I can get in and out of Burger King in four minutes. It's going to take me, it might take me 35, 45 minutes. And they will literally pass the Burger King up to go to the in and out Burger. Because you got, if you pass up a hamburger place, a fast food hamburger, to go to another fast food hamburger place, one is a three, no wait, and the other one is a 30 or 45 minute wait. You got to want that place bad, don't you? You got to want that place bad. And here's the thing is, when God, when, when the Lord, when he told people to repent, the question is, how bad did they want it? When, when the Lord sent people, when the Lord sent Jonah to, to Nineveh, and, 
And he, and, he, and, he, and he told him to give this message in 40 days. You got 40 days. I'm going to destroy this place if you don't repent. God wasn't expecting the Ninevites to just say, oh, my bad, I'm sorry. He was expecting them to get desperate because desperate times call for drastic measures. Sometimes when things are going on in your life, when things are going on in your nation, desperate times call for drastic measures. And when God was calling on people to repent, he was expecting them to weep and to mourn and to pray and to fast and to, and to get desperate about the situation. I believe that he, God, he's promised to heal our land and I believe he will heal our land. But I believe that as people of God, we got to want it. How many of you want to see revival? How many of you want to see our land healed? I want to ask this question. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Because I don't believe this is something that he wants us to take with a grain of, of salt. I don't believe he wants us to, something that he wants us to just, it's not something he's calling us to say, Lord, I'm sorry, just a, a quick little prayer. He's calling us to get serious. He's calling us to mean business. How many when you were a kid, your teacher or your mom or somebody that you know they were serious, when they got serious, they said, listen, I mean business. I mean, when somebody says they mean business, they're serious. When I mean business. And God, he means business. He means business. And while fasting and prayer won't get you into heaven, nor will it cause God to love you anymore, as we talked about last week, fasting and prayer will help you humble yourself before God. The fasting will help you disconnect from the things of this world. And start to kind of just detach from the things of this world. And the prayer will help you to connect to the heart of God and to the voice of God. And so, like I said in 2 Chronicles, he lists seven things. Four things that we're to do as the people of God. And three things that he promises to do. I want to share with you, I want to talk about prayer today because this is the second thing. Is, is that those times of fasting and prayer, like I said, we... we uh, um, Every day we have a time of prayer, a time of corporate prayer. I want to encourage you to join in and be a part of that. But what happens when God's people with the right motives begin to pray and fast? What happens when God's people with the right motives begin to pray and fast? Number one, our hearts begin to change. When God's people with the right motives begin to pray and fast, our hearts begin to change. Because here's the thing about fasting and prayer is I believe, how many believe prayer is powerful? The Bible says the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. But there's something about these two spiritual disciplines that God gave us when you put them together, that fasting and prayer. I'm going to tell you it's powerful because that fasting will, as you deny yourself, it's going to cause you, when you do it with the right heart, when you do it with the right heart, it's going to cause you when you're pushing away food because fasting means to abstain from, it means to abstain from food for spiritual purposes. And like I said, when you, when you look at the scriptures, that so many of these men and women of God in the scriptures, they fasted. The people in the, uh, in the disciples, the, they fasted. People all throughout Christian history, they fasted. And when it's, it's not something that uh, we do it once a year at the church, but it, I think if you took a poll of, of evangelical Christians, but most of them don't. We don't fast. It's, a, it's kind of a lost discipline in some ways. And the thing is that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he expected that his followers were going to be fasting. He said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. And it's something that he's given us to do that helps us. It's not going to, it's not going to cause God's love for you to increase. But here's the thing about fasting. It's not going to cause God's Love for you to increase because how many know God loves you? He loves you infinitely. Um, and so when we fast and pray and say, man, if I fast, maybe God's going to love me more. It's not going to cause God's love for you to increase, but it might cause your love to increase for God. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? Um, it might not, it's not going to cause God's love for you to increase, but it will, it might, it's going to cause your love for God to increase because as you deny yourself, as you humble yourself, it's going to cause you to get in tune with him more. And so fasting, it causes our hearts to begin to change. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, it's in the New King James Version. He says, God says, this is not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness 
to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. I believe if there's a, a, an addiction in your life, if there's a habit in your life that you're trying to shake, that you're trying to break, I believe if you will start fasting, I believe that fasting is because you, the thing about fasting, as you fast and as you pray, your flesh gets weaker. As you fast and as you pray, you start to detach from the cares of this world. You start to, your, your mindset starts to change and, and, and your flesh gets weaker. And as you start to focus on prayer and as you start to focus on the word of God and as your flesh gets weaker and as your spirit starts to get stronger, I believe that you're going to find the strength to break some of those habits. Some of us have behaviors and, and habits that we need to break, things that we need to turn away from. And as we fast and pray and the flesh gets weaker and the spirit gets stronger, it's going to give you the strength to do that. Fasting and praying is powerful. When I went over to Israel, if you ever get to go over to Israel, you'll see this. You might get to see one of these things. It's a mikvah. It's, a, it's an ancient mikvah. And it's kind of like a baptismal pool that they dig out. Because when they went to the synagogue or they went to the temple, they had to go before they went up to the temple. They had to get down in water. They had to go down in one of these things. And, and, and they, had, they would get up to their waist or whatever. And, and they, would, they would wash. And it was a, 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 um, it was a symbolic ceremony that they were washing off the things of this world. Because how many know just when you live in this world, when you hang around at the systems and the things and the ideas of this world, when you live in this world, if you just, if you stay in the world and you stay around the world, then it, stuff is going to rub off. Stuff is going to rub off. And we have to, we have to, God has called us to be holy. How many know God has called us to be holy? He's called us to be righteous and be set apart in that discipline of fasting and prayer. It's going to help start to break some of the chains of sin off of your life and, and, and change your heart. Because like I said, if we, if we want to see revival in our nation, it's got to start with us. If we want to see change in our land, it's got to start with us. So many people are posturing and positioning and trying to show that they're right. But the bottom line is it starts with our hearts. It starts with us looking at ourselves. And so what happens when God's people with the right motives begin to pray and fast? Number one, our hearts begin to change. The second thing when God's people begin to pray and fast is spiritual strongholds are broken. When God's people begin to pray and fast, spiritual strongholds are are broken. And the thing is, is there's a, there's a war going on. There's a battle going on. Uh, I read a, an article this week and it was talking about the fact that really you could say, you can make the argument that as a country that we're in a, we're in a civil war. It might not be any shots fired, but people are so, they're so at each other's throats. They're, they're so against one another. And, and it's like, it's like people will do anything they can, say anything they can to try to hurt the, what they perceive to be the other side. But I think a lot of times we don't realize that there may be a battle going on inside of our nation. But there's a battle going on that we can't see. There's a spiritual battle going on that we can't see. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And there's a spiritual battle going on. And if, if you're fighting flesh and blood, if you think that person is your enemy, then you've got the wrong, you've got the wrong enemy. And the thing is, there's spiritual strongholds that need to come down. How many ever seen the Indiana Jones movies? I, I'll never forget when I was a kid that scene in Indiana Jones where, uh, have, you ever, have you ever been watching a movie where the people are armed, they got guns, but the, the producer wants to show like a fist fight, so they got guns and they just drop them and they're fighting one another with their fist. Uh, I never under, really understood that. But how many remember that? That scene in Indiana Jones where that he, this guy comes up to him there on a bridge. This guy comes up and he pulls out a sword. And you think, man, he is in trouble. There's fixing to be a sword fight. And Indiana Jones looks at him. He has a gun. He pulls out a gun and shoots the guy. Um, there's no reason to get into a sword fight if you got a gun, right? Uh, and here's the thing. Is that I think we're bringing, the wrong, we're bringing the wrong weapons to the fight. Because here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, it says, though we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
See, I think that a lot of times we're bringing the wrong weapons to fight. We, the, what the world is telling us what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the weapons of information. What can I say? How bad can I, well, how bad can I say something? How, maybe I can call somebody a name. Maybe I can say somebody to hurt them. We're bringing the wrong weapons to the fight. We're trying to fight with the weapons of this world. But God has given us spiritual weapons through prayer and fasting that have the power to bring down strongholds. They have the power to demolish these spiritual battles that are going on uh, around us. I love, look at this quote. I love reading um, Bill Bright. He's the founder of Campus Crusades for Christ, and he's the one that funded this um, Jesus Jesus film, Jesus movie that is the the most watched movie of all time. But he says, I believe the power of fasting as it relates to prayer is the spiritual atomic bomb that our Lord has given us to destroy the strongholds of evil and usher in a great revival and spiritual harvest around the world. There's power in prayer and fasting together is power. And here's what Jesus, when he was preparing for his uh, ministry, because Jesus, he was on this earth for 33 years. And for the, first 30, th- for the first 30, he really, there's not a lot of writing about Jesus. He waited until he was 30. And then he went around for three years and he concentrated his efforts on those three years. But when Jesus was preparing, uh, he fasted and prayed. Matthew chapter four, verse, verses one and two, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And so Jesus, he, he prepared for this, for this time of ministry by fasting and prayer. In Matthew 4, 10 and 11, it said, uh, after the devil had tempted him, Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. There's power in prayer and fasting. There's power to push back strongholds. There's power to fight spiritual battles. And we're in a spiritual battle, but I think so many times we're trying to fight this spiritual battle with these natural weapons. But prayer and fasting is powerful. It's a powerful weapon. What happens when God's people pray and fast? Number three, the armies of heaven respond. The armies of heaven respond. Daniel chapter 9 uh, verse, verse 2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the scriptures according, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. And look what happened here down in uh, verse 21. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel The man I'd seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, a word went out. As soon as you begin to pray, a word. How many of you could use a word from the Lord today? As soon as you begin to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. As soon as you went to pray, as soon as he was praying and fasting, Gabriel said, a word went out. A word went out. And I could, we could read it, Acts chapter 13 like we did last week as they were praying and fasting. That's when God spoke to them. And I could have made that one of the points today is that when, as we're praying and fasting, we're going to hear God's voice more clearly. But there's angelic activity. You see that there's a spiritual battle going on. And when God's people start to pray and fast, there's angelic activity. There's in, uh, in the scripture... There are the talks about angels, but there's only three angels in the scripture uh, that are listed by name. One of them is Michael, and he's a warrior. One of them is Gabriel, and he's a, a messenger. He's what came to Daniel here when he was praying and fasting. The other angel, a fallen angel that's listed by name is Lucifer, and he's a, the shining one. He's a fallen angel. As we know, but as you see in Daniel chapter nine, when Daniel starts fasting and praying, Gabriel said, as soon as you started a word of a word went out and the Lord sent him to give Daniel this message. If we were to read over, I don't have time for it this morning, but if we were to look over in Daniel chapter 10, a few years later, Daniel started to fast and pray. And when Daniel started to fast and pray, Michael was sent out to, to come against the king of Persia. And so we may not see it. You may not see it. 
But just because we don't see it, believe, when we're fasting and praying, there's angelic activity going on. The heavens are moving. The armies of heaven are moving for us. The Bible says that God sends his angels to encamp around those that love him. And there's a, like I said, there's a spiritual battle. If you think the battle that our nation today faces is fierce, I believe that if we could see the spiritual battle, because the battle, a lot of times the battle that our nation is facing is over money, it's over power. Who's going to be in power? But the battle in the spiritual is over souls. It's over the lives of people, the souls of people. And if you think this battle that you see in your natural is fierce, I believe if we could see into the spiritual battle, we could say that that the battle that we're facing pales in comparison to the spiritual battle that's going on around. Because it is about the eternity of people. The battle we face as a nation is who's going to be in power for three years or four years or however long. The battle in the spiritual is over the souls of people, the eternity of people. And I believe it's a fierce battle, and I believe that God has given us a tool. He's given us weapons that when we fast and pray, that it has power to move the heavenlies. That's a power. Are you thankful for that power today? The question is, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Because like I said, when Jonah went into Nineveh, he wasn't expecting, you know, he wasn't expecting the people to give up Reese's peanut butter cups, okay? The king didn't say, look, it's bad. We're going to all, nobody eat Reese's pieces. You can eat everything else. But he was expect. They, they put on sackcloth. They got and they got down in the, in the dirt, and they, uh, everybody, the animals, the kids, everybody fasted. And here's what the Lord says in Second Chronicles. He, he said, if, would you say this to me, if, yeah. if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Like I said, a lot of times we say, well, I don't have any wicked ways. If you don't have, if you think you don't have any, if you think you can't change, and you don't need to change, it's probably because you haven't been seeking his face. If they'll humble themselves and pray and turn and, and seek my face and turn, then I will hear and I will forgive and I will heal. God's promise, how many know God's promises? You can take them to the bank. You can, you can depend on them. The question is, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? And you know, the only person I can control is me and the only person that that you can control is you, so we can't. I know there's a lot of churches around the nation. They're uh, praying and fasting. They do it during this time of January. But the question is, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Because God has promised. He's promised to heal our land. When we fast and pray, the armies of heaven respond. When we fast and pray, the word of God goes out. And so there's power. There's power in fasting and prayer. And the last one today is when we... When God's people fast and pray, God responds mercifully. God responds mercifully. I was studying about these times in our nation, the great awakenings that's happened in our nation. And they're all connected to God's people repenting and fasting and praying. Early American evangelist Jonathan Edwards, he organized uh, fasting days in the colonies. Uh, he organized fasting days through his church in, in Massachusetts, that he pastored, and this was prior to the Great Awakening, and all these times of revival, times of revival. I got, Jen and I had the, had the we had the privilege in the 90s to go to this uh, Brownsville Revival. Anybody else go to this thing, Brownsville Revival, that happened in Florida? And, and we went out to her grandmother lived down there, so we went, we stayed with her grandmother, and we got there a couple hours, it was like a seven o'clock service, and we got there at like five, because you're supposed to get there, some people get there at eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning to try to get a seat, in the sanctuary, we got there at like 5, 5.30, not knowing if we'd even get into any of it. We didn't get into the sanctuary, but we got into the overflow. Overflow, remember, we were in the cafeteria, and there was no less presence of God in the cafeteria than there was, I don't think, in the sanctuary. I wasn't in the sanctuary, but I mean, it was, it was powerful. But the thing is, when people, I believe there's, a, when people, when their hearts begin to turn towards the Lord, because the Lord is, he's ready and willing, he's ready and willing to pour his power out. He's ready and willing to pour his mercy out. And here we have, we've been dealing with this, this plague for almost a year now. And my question is, God, what is it going to take for, the, for your people, for me, for your people? What is it going to take for your people to get to the point to where we say, we are desperate. We got to have something. We got to have a miracle. We're desperate. 
What's it going to take? What's it going to take? And I'm with those people in this, we're at these people in this line, an hour and a half, getting there an hour and a half before church, just hoping you can get in an overflow room. I'm going to tell you, you get in an environment like that, and it's pretty much guaranteed when you get in there, it's going to be, it's going to be powerful because people are hungry for God. And when people, come with a, uh, when people come with a heart of expectation, I don't care what song you're singing or what style it is. When people come with an expectation, God's power is going to be poured out. When people come with desperation, God's power is going to be poured out. And I want to ask you, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? We wanted that in and out burger bad enough that we waited in 38 degrees for about 35 minutes to get a hamburger, okay? A hamburger. How bad do you want revival? Here in Jeremiah 18, verses uh, 7 and 8, it says, God says, if at any time, would you say this to me, any time, If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. God's merciful. He's compassionate. He said, if at any time, if I announce that a nation is going to be uprooted, destroyed, if at any time, if they, at any time, if they... If they repent, then I will relent. I won't do it. I won't send the disaster. And so there's power. There's power in prayer and fasting. I want to ask Jared to go ahead and come up. We're going to pray in just a moment. We're going to close. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you as a pastor of this church. I want to encourage you to participate with us in this time of fasting. And if you, if you haven't already started, I want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord what he would have you to do. Because I know it's not easy. It's not easy. It's difficult. How many of you love food? How many of you, when you go on vacation, you plan the days around food? Or you plan the vacation around food? A lot of times we go on vacation, we plan it around food. Food is an important part of our life, and we're blessed with some good food here. And I love food, but there's a spiritual discipline that the Lord has given us. The discipline of fasting, and it's not easy. It was not designed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Like I said last week, is the King James Version says, afflict yourself. On the day of Yom Kippur, he told them to afflict themselves. And if, if it's easy, if it's really easy, um, then you're, you're, not, you're really probably not doing what the Lord has given you to do. It's difficult. It's challenging. I can remember when I was a young man, and the, when I was 15, 16 years old, so we were going to go on a we're going to go on a 21-day fast. We're going to do the Daniel fast or whatever we're going to do. Uh, it's hard for a young man to get pumped up about that, all right? Because when I was 15, 16, I could eat a whole large pizza from Domino's by myself. And to go without that, I could go without food, no problem, for about three or four hours. Um, but I, could, I, it, I just didn't get excited about it. And I can remember when I first started in, and I first started practicing this discipline of, of fasting. And the, like I said, the Bible says that fa- fasting is abstaining from food, okay? You can go away from Facebook. That might be great. Um, you can go away from social media. That, that might help you a lot. You can say, well, I'm not going to watch the news this time. That might help you. I'm not going to watch TV for this time. That might help you. But what God, was, what God was calling them to do when he said, humble yourself from the scriptures is to abstain from food either a partial fast or a full fast, for for a time period to abstain from food in order to humble themselves and prayer. Disconnect from the world and connect into God. And and once again, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. A lot of times, and I knew this growing up, I've been, most of my life I've been in, I worked worked at Six Flags when I was a teenager and I worked at car sales, in car sales for a few months. And after that, I started working at church full time. And I've been doing that for most all my career. I've been in ministry full-time working in churches. And I know a lot of times when you, one of the things as a pastor is that you know is that when you, when you do a prayer meeting, um, you know your attendance, you're not going to have as many people at the prayer meeting probably as you do at a, uh, you know, whatever else you do, pizza meeting or something like that. Um, it's not something that maybe people get, some people don't get super excited about. But like I said, here's the thing we got to ask ourselves the question, how bad do you want it? Would you agree our nation needs healing? Would you agree that it's pretty bad? 
Would you agree we're at a point, we're at a point of crisis? How many agree that our nation, that our world, how many agree that our nation right now is in a crisis? There's people that are dying and they're going to spend eternity away from, away from God. They're going to, they're going to go to eternal punishment. And as the people of God, we've got to, we've got to step up. This is time. It's time. It's time. And he got, he didn't make it easy. He didn't, he didn't make it convenient. But he's calling us to prayer and fasting. So I want to encourage you, if you want to spend that time of prayer, spend that time of prayer each day. If you can join on with us. Like I said, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. You just click, click that button and listen in. You don't have to. You don't have to share your video. You don't have to have your hair combed. You don't have to put your suit on or whatever because you don't have to share your video. But just join in with us. I want to ask you, how many would join in for the time of prayer and fasting? How many would join in with us? Because here's what God says. I want to, I want to read it again. Because, again, there's seven things, and he puts four of them on us. He says, if, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray that the Lord would stir our hearts. God, we are in a, we're in a crisis. We are in a crisis. We have had a a worldwide pandemic that we've been dealing with for 10 months. The, the numbers, the statistics say that 400,000 people have died from this. And it seems like it continues to rage on. It's hurting our economy. It's disrupting our way of life. People are upset. They're at each other's throats. God, there's contention. There's vying for power. And position. And so many people, God, are pointing the finger at the other person. And God, we need help. It's not something that's happened overnight. Believe me, this is not something that's happened overnight. This has been decades in the making. It's been up where our nation is going towards. Because if you reject God, then you find yourself in a huge mess. And in so many ways, we've turned our back on him. And God, we ask you to forgive us. Forgive our nation. Heal our land, Lord. I pray that you would stir the hearts of your people today. And I pray that we would humble ourselves and that we would pray, that we would seek your face, that we would repent. Lord, I pray that during this time of prayer and fasting that you would send. God, I know that there's spiritual strongholds being broken over people's life. There may be addictions that are broken. There may be bad habits that are broken. Lord, you're breaking the chains of sin. God, help us. Help us to seek you. Help us to get desperate for you. And help us to see a revival in our nation. Lord, we pray once again for this week as the inauguration takes place. And and God, so many things that are happening. There's so many important things in our nation that are happening. But God, there may be tension. And Lord, I thank you for peace. God, I thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. But God, I know in the background there's a spiritual war going on. And so God, we're just asking you to to pull down down darkness and demonic strongholds that are over our nation right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask you to push back the forces of darkness in Jesus' name. The forces that are trying to divide us and conquer us. Lord, I thank you that, that, that it will not stand. God, stir the hearts of your people to repentance, to prayer, to desperation. God, may we want your presence so bad. God, that we'll we'll seek you with our whole heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're having a prayer tonight at 7 p.m.